and welcome back. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Under the Influence. And tonight we will be watching a little documentary on alcohol and why you must quit. In my early 20s, I was a big drinker, but not so much anymore. So because I really don't like the uh, effects of alcohol after a certain point. Three or four drinks, I'm good. But after that, it starts to go downhill for me at least it doesn't get better as the night goes on so i just want to take a look at this it kind of shows how the body functions and what happens to the body and the brain when it's ingesting alcohol look at how it's portrayed in the movies look at how it's marketed look at the branding of alcohol heck look at the hundreds of celebrities that are launching their own alcohol brands or endorsing different kinds of alcohol we are bombarded with information yeah, nobody ever questions why when we drink so much marketing is towards alcohol of being born in the world but here's the crazy thing if we were to make every single drug legal and you could go into a pharmacy or a chemist and they had all the drugs that are currently illegal all there available for purchase but it was the 100 percent pure substance of every single drug it wasn't cut with anything like that it was just a pure drug if you walked into that store Store, you would have a bottle of pure alcohol that nobody would ever buy because there'd be a label on it saying warning do not consume this will kill you if you drink this entire bottle you will die that would be the drug that everybody would be scared to go near but that exact same drug is the same thing that tens of millions of people are drinking they're just drinking the diluted version it's of just it. diluted it's poison insanity. <laughs> and finding conflicting information about how great alcohol is isn't easy so today in this video we've compiled a list of experts who are challenging the status quo and they're not afraid they're to just go diluting against the it with the flavors that your taste buds like so if you want some motivation on getting alcohol out of your life, watch this entire video. I hate to break it to you, but the reality is ethanol produces substantial damage to cells. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells, and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. Alcohol is often used as a sleep aid but alcohol is quite different in that regard. Alcohol is trying to essentially knock out your cortex. There is no safe dose of alcohol because alcohol affects the development of synapses of the brain. People who drink at an early age heavily have been shown to have significantly smaller brains and reduced cognitive ability. If we had to make a bad drug legal, the worst choice was alcohol. It is one of the most destructive drugs to various parts of your, of your body and different organs. The key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison, and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. It is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. In thinking about the biochemical effects of alcohol and what it's doing to the body, what it's doing in all cases, it's consumed into the gut, the liver immediately starts this conversion, ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate, and some amount of acetylaldehyde and acetate are making it into the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Most things, thankfully, can't pass across the blood-brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence and into the milieu, the environment of the brain. So it goes into every nook and cranny in the brain, and there it has lots of influences so it slows down the excitatory signals, it speeds up the inhibitory signals. In the prefrontal cortex, this is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning, perhaps above all, in suppression of impulsive behavior. And as you shut down the prefrontal cortex, that GABAergic suppression of impulses starts to be released. So people will say things that they want to say without so much forethought about what they're saying. Or they might no do filters. things that they want to do without really thinking it through quite as much, or they might not even remember thinking it through it all. Probably the most common detriment that alcohol has to the brain is the fact that alcohol is a depressant to the central nervous system. So it impairs your judgment, it impairs your reflexes, and your ability to think through. And top-down inhibition is diminished. That is, habitual behavior and impulsive behavior starts to increase. This is true in the short term, so after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks, but it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior. For the person that drinks, say, every Thursday night, or goes out only on Saturdays, but every Saturday, there's evidence that there are changes in the neural circuits of the brain that control habitual behavior and impulsive behavior, and they are modified and strengthened in ways 
ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. The toxic effects of alcohol disrupt those mood circuitries at first making them hyperactive. This is why people become really talkative. People start to feel really good after a few sips of alcohol, at least most people do. Then as they can ingest more alcohol, serotonin levels and the activity of those circuits really starts to drop. And that's why people feel less good. And typically what they do, they go and get another drink and they attempt to kind of restore that. That's when I stop being in mood. I know, I know my limit. Is that as people ingest the third and fourth, maybe even the fifth drink, there's an absolute zero chance of them recovering that energized mood right? Most people, as they drink more and more, will now start to feel more and more suppressed. The forebrain is now shutting down quite a lot. A lot of the motor cortical areas that control coordinated movement and deliberate movement start to shut down. So people start to slur their speech. People start to shuffle their feet. People forget their posture. People start to lean on things. People start passing out on couches. There's a great depression. And the second thing it does is reduce anxiety. Yeah. And so if you are a bit more socially anxious and you also have that positive response to alcohol, which everyone doesn't have, by the way, then it's a great drug. But the problem is it's well it's a great drug for the moment right <laughs> right there's there's consequences recent study however finally addressed the question of whether or not low to moderate amounts of alcohol consumption can cause brain degeneration what they found was that even for people that were drinking low to moderate amounts of alcohol, so one or two drinks per day, there was evidence of thinning of the neocortex, so loss of neurons in the neocortex and other brain regions. Binge drinking definitely kills brain cells. It alters neural communication in such a way that it can change the structure and the function of the brain for a long term. Anytime you binge drink, you're gonna alter the brain probably permanently. Um, the plasticity can help it recover, but the more you do this, the less likely you are to be able to sort of overcome those um, perturbations. Well, he said low to moderate drinkers, and that's one to two drinks a day. Now, I don't know a lot of people who drink during the week, but if that's two drinks a day, five days a week, that's 10 drinks a week. So if you have, like, if you have 10 drinks on a weekend, is that this is that considered a moderate drinker it's like having two drinks a day it's probably worse because you're consuming 10 drinks in a matter of hours as opposed to having one or two drinks every day it sounds weird to have one or two drinks a day but when you think about it if you drink 10 that's like having one or two a day so same thing. If people are ingesting alcohol chronically, even if it's not every night, there are well-recognized changes in neural circuits. There are well-recognized changes in neurochemistry within the brain. And there are well-recognized changes in the brain-to-body stress system that generally point in three directions. Increased stress when people are not drinking, diminished mood and feelings of well-being when people are not drinking, and as you'll soon learn, changes in the neural circuitry that cause people to want to drink even more in order to get just back to baseline or the place that they were in terms of their stress modulation and in terms of their feelings of mood before they ever started drinking in the first place. And this is where alcohol is a really clever drug. Alcohol is a very promiscuous drug. It, it gets into the brain and it changes all the good neurotransmitters that you want to change, you know, a bit of endorphins, a bit of serotonin, a bit of GABA, you know, it's a, it's a really clever drug. And uh, gradually it sort of eats, it worms its way into you. So eventually it kind of takes over and you get to the situation like, you know, that you've described and, you know, I've had patients of mine who say, they just find themselves drinking. They don't even intend to drink. They just suddenly, they're drinking. They don't know how they got there. They don't want to do it. They don't even enjoy it very much, but they can't stop. It becomes a compulsion. Yeah, I was like that. So there's an increase in dopamine and an increase in serotonin. So it's kind of an increase in well-being, an increase in mood, but it's a very short-lived increase. Very soon after, and actually triggered by that increase, is a long and slow reduction in dopamine and serotonin and related molecules and circuits. What you're getting is a blip of feel good followed by a long, slow arc of feeling not so great, which is yeah. why typically people will drink again and again across the night. And many people Try make a mistake of then going and pursuing the dopamine evoking, the dopamine releasing activity or substance again, thinking mistakenly that it's going to bring up their baseline. It's going to give them that peak again. Not only does it not give them a peak, their baseline gets lower and lower because they're depleting dopamine more and more and more. And we've seen this over and over again. When people get addicted to something, then they're not achieving much pleasure at all. Addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure. So oftentimes what will happen is the person only has excitement and can achieve dopamine release to the same extent doing that behavior and not other behaviors. 
And so they start losing interest in relationships. They start losing interest in fitness and well-being and depletes their life. Yep. And eventually what typically fitness happens is, a big is they will stop getting dopamine released from that activity as well. And then they drop into a pretty serious depression. And this can get very severe and people commit suicide from these sorts of patterns of activity. But alcohol has effects in lots of different areas of the brain, not just that sort of reward area, but it's also involved in a range of other neurotransmitters beyond dopamine. So, you know, things like glutamate and GABA and other parts of the brain, the hippocampus, which is involved in memory, the uh, cerebellum, which is the back part of your brain that's involved in, in motor coordination. And likewise, when, when someone is alcohol dependent, it is one of the most destructive drugs to various parts of your, of your body and different organs systems. Worst case scenarios can be things like alcohol related dementia or delirium which are serious brain problems or cirrhosis would be another really major problem. Dementia. Like these are things that people become extremely ill and need to go into a nursing home or people just die from. The acts on proteins in every bottom sy body system, uh, not just the brain but on the kidneys, on the liver, uh, you name it, it acts there and so it's a pharmacological hand grenade because um, it indiscriminately can alter the function of proteins in cells everywhere in your body. Alcohol causes depression, it causes the opposite. It doesn't relieve anxiety, it causes anxiety. If the main thing uh, in your internal or external world is a negative thing, alcohol will exaggerate that context. Alcohol is one of the leading behavior-related uh, causes of health problems and deaths, and also some social problems and, and economic costs, I, you know, ranging from things like injuries and accidents to cancers and actually- We all know that, that's undisputed. So it causes a wide range of but well, we still do it. When it comes to health, you know, less is we more. We still poison our bodies. I don't know why. Alcohol is actually considered a class one carcinogen or cancer causing agent by the World Health Organization. So that's the same category as benzene and tobacco smoke. And some studies estimate that a, a drink of alcohol has about the same cancer causing potential as one to two cigarettes, depending on your, your sex. And alcohol also makes people aggressive. It's the only drug we know that actually makes people aggressive. So you see a yeah. massive effect on crime that's rate. facts because half the people who murder someone are drunk oh yeah and half the people who are murdered are drunk no family in britain if you look at an extended family three generations in which, which doesn't have someone who's been damaged by alcohol through addiction through violence traffic accidents or being a victim because of someone else who was drunk and violent almost every family in britain is affected but we don't own up to it right we kind of push it under the carpet, you know, we, we know there's a problem. But we I had a friend, he died in a car accident. What to do about it, we're embarrassed. People are fearful of We all knew he was a drinker and... Because it helps deflect their attention away from... It was almost like a matter of time. Politicians love to get hysterical about a new drug because it means they can do something about drugs and they don't have to be held to account over their failure to deal with the problems of alcohol. Is drinking good for me in any way? For instance, many people have probably heard that resveratrol is good for people and that red wine is enriched in resveratrol. I hate to break it to you, but the reality is that if indeed resveratrol is good for us, and there's some debate about this, some people say strongly yes, some people say no, other people say maybe, the amount of red wine that one would have to drink in order to get enough resveratrol, in order for it to be health promoting, is so outrageously high that it would surely induce other negative effects that would offset the positive effects of resveratrol. No consumption, zero consumption, consumption of zero ounces of alcohol is going to be better for your health than low to moderate consumption of alcohol. You do stupid things when you're drunk. It makes sense. You hurt yourself, you, you compromise your health, it's really hard on the people around you, you tend to turn into a liar, and it screws up your life. Yeah. It's like, yeah, but it's pretty fun. Yeah, well it is, but you need something better than that. And what's better isn't being straight and, 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 and not making mistakes. It's like, that's all prohibition in some sense. What's mm -hmm. better is, no, you need an adventure, man. You need to get out there and have something to do. Yeah. And, and something worth waking up for. And you need, that's the substitute for the addiction. So that was just a little look at uh, the effects of alcohol and what it does to your brain and body. There's really not much I can say. You can look into this, learn more about it, and we'll see you next time under the influence.